everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining from. My name is Barton Seeger, and I am super thrilled that you are joining us yet again for another uh, webinar here. Appreciate, first and foremost, the folks, my teammates at ruby.com for hosting this and for you for uh, joining through them. I also want to say thank you to my beloved ladyfish wife, who is behind the camera today as we are coming to you from home. So today, we're going to be talking to you about whitefish, sort of the cod family. Uh, some of America's favorite species. We'll be talking about diversity of different uh, products that are available to you, as well as a number of cooking techniques. So before we dive in, if I could just uh, introduce myself. My name is Barton Sieber. I am a chef, author, uh, a National Geographic explorer, and generally uh, a seafood evangelist. It is my mission to get more people eating more seafood across all demographics uh, for the purposes of environmental health, for our health, certainly, as well as for economies. And I am joining you here with my wife, as I said, from the brave, jagged, ragged, delicious, clean coast of Maine, where, well, these shores were, were first uh, settled as America under the banner of cod, so whitefish. I think this is a, a very important thing up here. Um, so my work has taken me all over the world. Uh, I'm very interested in sustainable food systems because, well, we eat to sustain our bodies, but we also, through eating, that is the most intimate of relationships that we have with our natural world. And so we should be paying attention, be mindful of the impacts that our choices make both on our bodies as well as on the world, which is why I want to get people eating more seafood across all demographics. And here's why on that. So seafood... Well, it comes from a generally neutral environment, a buoyant environment. You and I and pigs and chickens and cattle and everything else, well, we're fighting gravity and atmospheric pressure. And we spend a lot of energy to keep our blood warm. And we grow big bones and lots of connective tissue. And fish, well, no, they just kind of float, dude. Yeah, they're just kind of hanging out. So it's biologically just a, a very efficient form of growing protein and seafood as part of a veg forward or veg centric diet is a really great way for us to uh, achieve more sustainability in our food systems, but also especially with our own health. From a public health standpoint, from uh, just what we eat in terms of nutrition, seafood is so incredibly important to our diets. And omega-3 rich fatty, those omega-3 Fatty acids that uh, seafood can be so rich in are just so important for our cardiovascular health, for our neural development, as well as for cognitive, cognitive benefits throughout our lives. And, uh, well, I work with a lot of really, really great close colleagues, uh, first among them, the Seafood Nutrition Partnership. And I recommend that if you're interested in, in health at all uh, or just learning a little bit more about seafood, please visit them at Seafood Nutrition. Dot org. They've also got a really great campaign underway right now called hashtag Eat Seafood America. So if you're following any of the inspiration you get here today and you make any seafood dishes at home, you know what? Hey, post them on Instagram or Facebook and, and hashtag again, Eat Seafood America. Join the movement to inspire our neighbors and friends to, well, incorporate healthful seafood into our diets at home. And uh, well, hey, a healthy diet is one of the most essential things that we can do to keep ourselves safe. And that's always, and uh, especially true these days. So uh, with that, th these webinars are kind of purposed with, well, helping people get a little bit more comfortable with cooking seafood at home. Around 70% plus of the seafood eaten in America is eaten outside of the home. So in restaurants or in food service, you know, I mean, this is the McDonald's filet of fish. This is red lobster. This is your, you know, fancy roasted halibut at your independent local neighborhood restaurant. Uh, all of that together. That's where we eat seafood is outside of the home. So in these days of the COVID pandemic and us sort of a return to the home kitchen, incorporating seafood is, well, it's something new for a lot of people. And so I'm thrilled that you're joining us today, whether as a complete amateur to cooking or a seafood expert just looking to hang out with friends. Uh, we appreciate you being here. So a little bit more about the assets that we have uh, in order to help with that. So I am also an author. I've got uh, a number of books that my wife designed and I've written, uh, Two If By Sea, American Seafood. And I've uh, supplied a number of recipes coming out of this book uh, for today's webinar. 
Uh, and American Seafood is, well, it's a guided history of the American seafood industry as told through a narrative and visual sketch of every single species landed in the United States. So if you're just interested in learning a little bit more about, well, where fish comes from, the cultures behind it, the history of our culinary, please check out those books. Uh, we always appreciate the support. And also uh, our course online through Ruby, seafoodliteracy.com. And uh, well, hey, we're here for you. Anything we can do to help. So diving into white fish or the cod family. Um, well, there's a whole lot of different species in this category. And the way that I generally think about seafood, well, is in culinary categories. Because if I, even as a chef who's dedicated myself to this, uh, you know, uh, to seafood as a career, I can't keep track of the 750 plus species that we land in the United States alone or the 2,000 plus species that are available globally. That is really intimidating. It's really intimidating. So I don't think you need to know all of those. What you need to know is culinary categories. A flaky white flesh fish like cod, well, guess what? It cooks exactly the same pretty much as a flaky white flesh fish like hake. So when it comes to good fish cookery, the very best thing you can do is buy great quality fish. And diversity is one of the very most important things that you can do to, to ensure that. And here's why. If your recipe says cod and you walk into the store and you say, I need cod, and they say, well, the cod we have is a week and a half old, and well, that's it. And you say, well, okay, well, that's what I need, cod. What you're not hearing from the person behind the counter is, but hey, we had some pollock come in today, also known as blue cod. Woo, it is gorgeous coming in off the boats in the middle of springtime, right before they get set to spawn. They are so fat and luscious and rich in flavor. And this is prime peak season. And I got it right now on a boatload special for $5 less a pound than the cod. Well, hey, that sounds pretty good, right? Yeah, but the only way we're going to be able to take advantage of that is to open our thinking. To be able to say, oh, well, cod is a flaky white flesh fish, but so is pollock and Alaska pollock and haddock and hake and cusk and ling and monk and skate and wolf and dog and eel and ray and pout and place and flounder and wishback and blackback. And uh, I mean, I could go on and tilapia and catfish and swai and basa and bermond. I mean, I could go on. These are all flaky white flesh fish, folks. And by and large, generally, they cook in similar ways. So if you've got a dish like cod braised in a spiced tomato sauce, hake braised in a spiced tomato sauce is going to eat very similarly. So when I think about this, it's like, well, think about the dish, not the fish necessarily. So the fish that I have in front of me today represents some of the diversity of the New England catch, where I am right here. Uh, it was a little hard for me to get uh, some other products this morning when I went out looking for them. So, but that's part of the story here. So I'm going to talk about some of the fish that are in front of me here. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions of you in the audience. I'd love to hear from you what your favorite fish to eat is, maybe in the white fish, flaky white fish category, uh, and maybe a sentence or two on why. And uh, I'd love to read some of those aloud and share. Um, but then I'm going to talk through a couple of these, uh, and then I'm going to prep up some dishes while we take some questions. And, uh, well, generally hope we're having a good time. So with that, I will ask my beloved camera operator wife to uh, begin to help me focus on some of the things that are down here on the board in front of us. And so these are coming to you or to us from our friends at Gulf of Maine Sashimi, some very dear friends in the Maine area and Portland area uh, who are doing great work with very high quality product that's bled at sea, uh, giving it a little bit more vigor and richness and flavor, uh, as well as our friends at Harbor Seafood down in Portland, Maine. And I just got to Give a shout out to our friends because, well, they supply me with fabulous fish and they deserve our support. Anybody who's here in Maine, please check them out. And uh, if you're not in Maine, I know that Harbor Fish uh, in Portland, Maine, does do some online shipping as well. So there you go. So what we've got here, well, the king of the whitefish. This is cod. And this is what's called a uh, captain's cut or the loin. And if you look at a larger fillet, this is hake over here. So the mate's cut is that thick piece right from the, from the top. This would be the head of the fish and obviously down towards the tail. So cod is known as the you know, big convex, rich, luscious flakes that sort of sit on the palate so well. 
Uh, it holds its moisture pretty well. It is uh, considered, you know, Mark Kurlansky has a great quote that he says, uh, cod is the default setting from which all other fish vary. <laughs> to a large extent, that's uh, that's true. So it is kind of the benchmark, the standard by which we measure the quality of fish. So cod, very familiar. It's going to have that larger, thicker fillet. So it's going to stand up to, well, braising a little bit better than maybe some of the thinner fillets. But that's just technical, more less so than it is about the species itself. Haddock, which I was pointing to, when it's nice, big, and thick, well, basically all of these fish cook very similarly, as I was saying earlier. So it's really about finding what are those other physical, physical, physical variables such as thickness. So some of the other species that I have in front of me, and again, what I'm saying here represents every other flaky white flesh fish that's not in front of me too, whether we're talking about farmed turbo from Spain, uh, uh, whether we're talking about swai or basa from Vietnam, uh, all the same in terms of how they manifest in a dish. So cod, then we have hake. Hake is my favorite member of the cod family. Uh, you can tell hake always by a telltale sign, and that is this ribbon that literally, quite literally looks like stitching that runs straight down the middle of the fish. You can also see that it's going to have a thinner, smaller flake to it. Uh, it's very much more delicate. But the flavor in this is more aromatic, sweet floral almost. Uh, and hake uh, is, you know, quite honestly, it's the fisherman's favorite. So people who uh, do this for a living, that's what they take home and eat. They'll sell you the cod and they'll eat the hake. So the next one that's coming up is another cod family member, and this is pollock. So pollock is uh, somewhat of an outlier in that it's, it's more muscular. It's a little bit uh, richer in flavor. You can even see in the coloration of it that it's going to have a little bit more intensity to flavor. But by intensity, what I mean to say is, well, deliciousness. Uh, you know, it's not more delicious than cod is necessarily, but it's got flavor. It's it, it's on the plate. It, it has a presence and a personality and some real charisma. But it's also got, as I said, a little bit more vigor. The flesh is a little tenser. It's a little denser even. And so, well, it lends itself to uh, all of the same dishes. However, it gives you a little more structural integrity. and It's a little easier to work with. The other fish here that I have is a haddock. These are two haddock fillets coming from a small fish. And this is a whole haddock over here, again, a small fish. They're absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous fish. And if cod is the fish of Massachusetts, then uh, haddock is the fish of Maine in terms of just popularity. But uh, they're both very large fisheries. Haddock, in fact, is, is larger than cod fishery right now in New England. Um, but Again, a very much of an analog fish to all these other ones. It has a little bit more aroma to it. I think the cod, well, it smells a little and very pleasantly so like mashed potatoes, uh, which is a wonderful trait to it. And haddock, well, it has a little bit more cucumber to it. It's a little sort of fresher tasting, uh, you know, without diminishing the quality of the cod. Another really fun thing about haddock, and I was uh, reading up in, in my book, American Seafood, on this topic, uh, before the webinar today, and I, I had forgotten the story, but if any of you are familiar with the biblical tale of uh, Jesus feeding the masses through loaves and fishes, uh, well, it's it's rumored, there, there's many different rumors about this, but that it was the cod that Jesus used to feed the masses, uh, and that then the devil was so jealous, <laughs> straighten that out, um, then the devil was so jealous about it that he tried to replicate the activity, and so he grabbed a haddock um, like that, but the haddock squirmed free of his grasp and was forever marked with a burned thumbprint, which is that black mark right there in the center, which is it's just kind of a fun story, right? Uh, I don't know what the actual purpose is of that black mark, but it's always there. It's a telltale sign, just a fun story. So. A couple of other analogs. So right now we've been talking about Atlantic fish, but you know what? There are Pacific fish in these same species that are virtually the same. Pacific cod, a giant sustainable fishery for that up in um, up in Alaska. Uh, well, it's a really great fish, and in a lot of taste tests, it would take a real expert to be able to tell you the difference in flavor between Pacific cod and uh, Atlantic cod in almost every application of it. 
The only difference that I've ever really noticed is that there's a silver skin running underneath the cod, uh, the Atlantic cod, uh, on the bloodline tissue that's not always there in the Pacific cod. Other than that, there's really no reason to know the difference from as long as you know what you're buying and are being sold the truth. Uh, another fish that I, I don't have any in front of me today, but is in Alaska pollock. Uh, and this is the world's largest single species fishery. It's a dense, meaty, white flesh fish. Uh, it's very lean. It's packed with nutrients and proteins. It, it's really just a fabulous, it, it is a uh, nutrition asset of America that we have this fishery within our waters. Uh, and that's the fish you might never have heard of but you've loved for many years, very likely. It is the fish behind the McDonald's filet of fish. It is on restaurant menus everywhere. It is in over a thousand different products. Alaska Pollock is what uh, imitation crab meat is made out of, which is, I, I gotta admit, I love that stuff. Um, so it's a really great quality fish and there's been a market push of late to get more of it sort of in recognizable form. Uh, to the market so that it's look, being sold as a filet, as a raw ingredient, rather than breaded or incorporated. So look for that one as well. Pacific rockfish is another really great one. Uh, it's a multi-species, end up being called Pacific rockfish, um, over 70 species, in fact. But under that one name is a really meaty, dense fish. It eats a lot like pollock in that way, a nice toothsome bite to it. And then, of course, as part of the flaky white flesh category are the flat fish. So flounder, sole, dab, place, and the far larger halibut. This in front of me right here, this is a yellowtail flounder, one of New England's uh, specialties. But uh, these cook very much similar. They have a slightly different fillet form because, well, the fish is a different form. And another little fun story, and then we're going to dive into some cooking over here is, uh, well, flatfish, you know, they're, they're pretty weird, right? They're colored on one side, they're white on the other. The reason for that is that if you're looking down on them on the sea floor as a predator, well, they're camouflaged in. You see, you can't see them from the top. And if you're looking up at them towards the top of the water, you can't see them because they blend in. So it's their camouflage. But what's really fun is that these guys all started life swimming like a normal fish, upright. And then at some point, well, their eye began to migrate towards the other side of their head and they flattened out. So if you thought puberty was hard or that high school was difficult, imagine what this guy had to go through. His eye moved to the other side of his head and they flattened out. So anyway, I have a lot of sympathy for, <laughs> my wife is laughing at me. I have a lot of sympathy for flatfish. <laughs> you good, honey? Yeah. Okay. So Patrick is my colleague at Ruby who's operating the controls here, and he might be able to read into my ear some of your favorites here. And I'm also going to click over um, to see uh, if anybody's. Uh, Haddock, hake, halibut in the house, all being, all getting called. Ooh, sablefish. Somebody's chimed in with sablefish, and I am with you on that. Sablefish is absolutely fantastic. It's super rich, luxurious. It eats like haddock in terms of like uh, richness of Chilean sea bass or just straight up butter. It's absolutely delicious. All right, so I'm going to ask my wife to join me over on the stove here. So if you'll give us a second just to transition. So the first product that I'm going to be cooking for you um, is a braised salt cod. And I didn't talk about salt cod there in the, in the intro, but salt cod, well, it, there was many, many, most of human history, we haven't had refrigeration. Uh, and so preservation was done through salting, largely with seafood. And so with, with salt cod, that was really, I mean, it was such an important part of the economy here and the founding of the Americas, and it's such an important global food stuff in terms of being traded. But what it is, is salt cod is cod that's, well, it's salted and then left on racks uh, out in the sun and for that to wick out the moisture and for the wind to also dry it. And it goes through a fermentation process, so the flavor deepens and matures, and it becomes this wonderful, uh, just altogether different ingredient, but I thought it was fun to include it here. Um, and it comes a different texture. It's hard. So you have to get the salt out of it by soaking it uh, to a various degree, depending on your use. And that's what I've done here is about 24 hours in salt. 
And then what I've got in the pan here is uh, similar to one of the recipes I shared with you in a, a downloadable PDF there. That also, by the way, includes uh, a long rundown of, of a good number of the common market available species of flaky white flesh fish. So please uh, you know, download that, check that out. Okay, it's called the event document on the page, if you can find that link just below the video. All right, so in here, uh, instead of the braised fennel dish that uh, I shared with you, well, we're doing the same thing pretty much, but it's going to be a braised uh, butternut squash and leeks. Started it off with butter uh, because it's still really cold up here in Maine. It's like 40 degrees here today, so we're still in butter season. We haven't hit olive oil season yet. Um, just seared leeks and a little bit of uh, the baton or, or stick cut uh, butternut squash. I added some orange juice and some white and some white wine. And uh, what we're going to do is basically just braise the salt cod pieces in that. That's going to add all of the salt to the dish, even though I've soaked the salt cod. There's still some in there, and that's going to season everything around it. Um, and so that's going to steam. It's going to release a little bit of juice as the butternut squash and leeks and white wine all add, get all married, fun together uh, into a nice rich sauce. So. That is a very simple, straightforward dish. Instead of the butternut squash, you could do fennel, you could do celery, Belgian endive, radicchio, a host of flavors. That orange juice offsets the acidity of the wine with the sweetness, as well as uh, the butternut squash does. So you could do that with halibut. You could do it with cod. You could do it with any of the fish species that we've been talking about. So another dish here that I have is, um, uh, this is gonna be a deep poached fish. Uh, and I'm going to use the cod on this because deep poaching, and, and here I'm not talking so much about the dish in front of us so much as, well, these are techniques and just ways to utilize whatever's in your pantry up. A deep poach. Poaching is cooking anything, but in this case seafood, in liquid, in a flavorful liquid. And that liquid then imparts flavors to the fish. Deep poaching is when the fish is completely submerged in that flavorful liquid and when that liquid is then not used as part of the finished dish, typically. So the fish is placed in, as I'm going to do here. Uh, just cutting some portions of cod. Uh, and I've seasoned this cod a little bit ahead of time, and I'll talk to you about that. That's called green salting. So just dropping it into this flavorful liquid and then letting it sit at about 165 or so degrees. Uh, and what that does is it very evenly, slowly uh, cooks that fish, imparting all those flavors into it. Shallow poaching, though, shallow poaching is when the fish uh, is not submerged and that it is flipped over typically at some point during the process. And then that liquid is then reduced after cooking and used often mounted with butter as the sauce. So with this, in this liquid, I've got some red wine vinegar that I make at home here. Because, well, my wife doesn't drink wine, but I do, and I've decided in my life that zero glasses is not enough, and four glasses is way too many. So uh, with wine that I'm fortunate enough to have left over, um, it goes into a barrel, and I age it. That's just a fun ingredient to have. But that adage of, like, white wine with fish, no red wine, ain't true, folks. It just ain't true. You know what the best pairing of, of wine and seafood is? It's the wine you like to drink with the seafood you like to eat. Sure, there's some more nuances that you can impose there, but bottom line is enjoy the process. Don't let anybody tell you what you enjoy. So that's going to cook at about 165 degrees, uh, but tap, uh, poaching is around 165 to about 180 is the, is the threshold there. And the reason for those lower temperatures is to cook that very low, slowly, delicately, because the fish that typically are poached tend to be leaner. And so we're a little less forgiving to high heat, as is true of basically this entire category. So the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to move this one over here. And then I'm going to show you a butter basted uh, and pan roasted dish. And I'm going to do this with hake. Now I'm going to point out the pan that I'm using first and foremost. So yeah, cooking seafood with any sort of saute pan where, where the, the contact between the pan and the fish is the point of cooking, as opposed to baking or roasting, in which the 
ambient temperature is the cooking agent. Any pan will work if you have it seasoned right, if you get it to the right temperature and add the right amount of oil and all that. But you know what? As a professional chef who's dedicated decades of my life to seafood, can I tell you what I use to saute? A nonstick pan. Do you know why? Because it's easier and because it doesn't stick. And you know what? Because even I screw up seafood cooking. I'm not going to tell you how often I do it, but yes, I even do it too. So my wife is, is generously saying, no, I don't ever mess that up, but that's very nice of you. Not often. Not often, she says. Okay, so I'm going to use a little bit of butter here. And once this gets hot, we're going to do a what I'm calling a pan roast. And so pan roast is starting it off as the saute. So getting that high temperature onto it, just a little bit of crust to it. You don't want to overly caramelize white flesh fish. It, it just doesn't respond well because the fish is so lean that the high heat will, in order to get that deep caramelization, it will end up overcooking and really shifting the textural uh, sort of personality of the fish to a level that I don't particularly care for. So what I'm showing you here is an integrated fish. And why I'm calling this pan roasting, I'm actually not even going to throw it in the oven for you. Uh, but that's kind of what I'm insinuating with that, is the nature that there's going to be more in this dish than just the fish. At this point, yes, I'm just sautéing it. Uh, but what I'm going to do is make a whole meal out of this, much the same way that this braise over here uh, is doing. And that's going to be done in just a minute. So you see how nice and non-stick that is, Rick? Yeah, if it's going to be that easy because I spent $31 on a pan or something, yeah, it's, hey, here we go. So what I'm going to add to this is now you see uh, the butter browning a little bit. Excuse me. You see the butter browning a little bit. So that's adding that great nutty rich flavor to it. I'm going to add some very thin slices of lemon. And uh, I believe that my father actually was uh, planning on joining this webinar today. And dad, if you're on, well, hey, this is pretty much the dish. So far, that uh, got me to love fish. When I was when I was a little kid, I had the incredible good fortune to be able to go sailing one time in New uh, Long Island Sound, and I was just pulling up flounder after flounder after flounder. And my dad was downstairs cooking them in just brown butter and lemon slices like this. And well, uh, since that moment, I was probably six years old or so. I've kind of known that fish was my future. So here we are. Thanks, Dad. I love you. Um, I'm going to throw in some olives here, and the last thing I'm going to throw in is rosemary. It's an herb not often associated with seafood because of its strength, the, the potency of it. You know, that's precisely illustrating one of the more interesting aspects of flaky whitefish, is that despite the lower intensity of flavor as opposed to something like a bluefish, well, they actually, the whitefish stand up to those big flavors like red wine and rosemary really pretty well. Um, somewhat of a pairing of opposites in that way. So what I'm going to do is flip those, and you can see that's about all of the crust that I want, and a lot of this darkness here that, quite honestly, is a little bit darker than I would typically go. That's A lot of that is the brown butter solids is helping you get that color, and you can begin to see the incredible delicacy of the texture of cake, which is what's here. So I've turned the heat down a little bit and what I'm going to do is just let the pan continue to cook that all the way through. Uh, it's going to flavor all the other ingredients are going to flavor the butter, the whole thing just simmering through and just low and slow and that'll be the last dish that we played up. So next thing I want to uh, finish this dish here and then we'll start taking some questions as we finish out. But, um, And pull out some of the the butternut, and again, this could be uh, butternut, any kind of squash. It could be zucchini, yellow squash. It could be uh, fennel, radicchio, you name it. Um, and so then, here's the salt cod, which we had braised down in that after soaking it, and you can see the texture of that cod. It's so beautiful. 
And salt cod, once it's cooked like this, gets sort of gets that texture back, that long convex flake, um, and just that wonderful meaty rich texture to it. So it's um, just a really nice way to, to utilize fish, and you can make it at home. It doesn't need months. You can just salt it ahead of time for maybe even a day, two days, uh, and that will really help set that texture. And that's what I was talking about a little bit earlier when I mentioned green salting. And simply put, that seasoning fish, well, a couple, you know, a, uh, at least a couple of minutes, but up to a couple of days even before using. What that does, the salt absorbs in. And, well, it strengthens, it tenses the texture of the white fish, giving it a little bit more structural integrity, um, but also uh, maturing that flavor a little bit. So the last thing I would do with this, and I'm not going to do it on, on screen here, but I would take this braising liquid and reduce that. You know, if I was serving all of these pieces, I would reduce that down to a thick syrup. Uh, maybe toss in some tarragon or something like that and then mount it with butter. And that becomes this rich, reduced, just awesomeness of sauce. And uh, yeah, so that's the first dish. That's salt cod. You can do that with anything, halibut. Anything thicker like that, that will give you some time to cook with it. So uh, the next dish that we've got is this hake, which might actually need a few more minutes here. So we're going to go to the house, to the uh, poached cod. And so with this dish, what I like about poaching is that it, it's so light, it's delicate, it's easy. You can do this ahead of time even, and then cool it down in the liquid, serve it the next day as a really... Simple, straightforward, and very elegant dish. And how I like to serve this is with a salad. Uh, and so what I've got here is uh, thin shaved fennel. I'm shaving some apple over this, and I'm being very careful with the micro, with the, uh, the mandolin here because it's the most dangerous item in any kitchen. So I'm just going to add a little bit of oil here and a little bit of that vinegar in mine. And this is just to dress, and this is shaved fennel. Herbs, uh, my favorite put in there is mint. Uh, we've got some scallions. Basically, anything you can get your hands on goes in there. And what's great about this is that it's a nice, bright, crunchy alternative to the fit, to this very softly textured fish. So, pulling this out of the liquid, just pull off any solids that you've got in there. The pieces of leek. And I'll put the warm fish right on top there. And then what I've got here, and this is giving you a recipe for this, this is a green goddess dressing. Uh, classic American cuisine. Uh, one of my very favorite. It's basically mayonnaise pureed with tarragon, parsley, watercress, yummy things, and a whole lot of anchovies. My very favorite ingredient. So with that, it's this, this wonderful way to add a component of richness to a very otherwise light, bright dish. And you can see the texture of that cod, it picks up a little bit of sort of the aroma and the color of the, uh, of the wine vinegar in there. But that gentleness of that heating method and leaves the fish so moist and so tender. And, uh, yeah. So for anybody that's afraid of overcooking your fish, um, use these low heat, low intensive methods. Uh, and that's what's gonna yield you um, consistent fish uh, each and every time and fish that you can be confident in cooking. All right, so I'm plating up the very last one here and this is the hake that turned off the uh, heat. I'll put that rosemary right on at some so much singes and chars up and just adds a wonderful bit of flavor. So I'd serve this with potatoes or something else where the, uh, the bright acidity of the, um, of the lemon and the caramelization of it, the crispness of the rosemary, the punctu punctuation of the olives. And you can see, again, in that cooking method, you see how much moisture is still on this filet. And that was saute. I wasn't really even paying attention to it. I was paying attention to you the whole time. Uh, so it's an easy, straightforward way of cooking. So, all right. So that's it for the demos. And now it's, uh, I think, time to take some questions. So I'm going to shift over here to the computer. And uh, say thank you so very much for operating the camera over there today.
And um, all right, so I'm going to head up to the top of the questions. So is it ever a good idea to cook directly from frozen coming in from Francine? Hey, Francine, thanks for joining. Uh, yes, I cook from frozen very often. Uh, frozen seafood is a, well, to talk about that for a second, a category of seafood that's been long shunned because, well, it earned a bad reputation when it was frozen on Saturday, having not been sold to the faithful few on Friday. Uh, yeah, it stop it from spoiling. But now fresh frozen technology, especially in fisheries uh, in the North Sea, uh, in New England, as well as uh, those up in Alaska, are doing such an amazing job freezing fish quite literally within hours of coming out of the water at such low temperatures that freezing is no longer a way to stop it from spoiling, but rather to arrest it at its absolute rate and keep it there until you, on a Tuesday night, are like, oh, man, what is for dinner? Guess I got some fish from the freezer. And then you take your frozen Alaska pollock or filet out of the freezer, salt it, uh, throw some bit of little onion powder, throw it behind me in the toaster oven there at 300 degrees from frozen. Yeah, it'll take a little while longer, but at lower temperatures, 300, absolute max 325, but I would go even 275. This works for salmon, any of the whitefish. Just throw it in there, let it cook low and slow, uh, and it will thaw. It will cook and it will retain its moisture all in one. It makes seafood pretty much the ultimate convenience protein, if you ask me. So, Francine, thanks for the question. Appreciate you. All right, from Alexander. Hey, Chef Barton. Hi. Really enjoyed your salmon presentation week. Uh, we did one of these to the rest of you uh, on salmon last week, and uh, which is archived, and you can go back and find that. But Alexander, you were saying, what would be the best spices to use with whitefish? Awesome question. Uh, things that bring out aromas or that are very aromatic in themselves. So pepper is not a good ingredient in my opinion with white fish always. Pepper makes things taste a lot more like pepper as opposed to what I find with ingredients like uh, cor uh, ground coriander or ground fennel, onion powder. Uh, those are ingredients that though certainly recognizable in their presence, do kind of take a step back in a way, and they're really good partner flavors. So uh, again, all things fennel with all things seafood are great, but especially with whitefish, uh, ground coriander, uh, a little bit of onion powder, and then my secret is mace. Mace is the seafood spice, if you ask me, and with whitefish particularly well. Mace is the lacy outer hull of nutmeg. Uh, nutmeg we all familiar with as a as a baking spice, but another part of that plant, and has a much more savory appeal to it, uh, and sort of lends itself to blending a little bit better. So try those spices, Alexander. Thanks for joining us again this week. Appreciate you. All right, from Cole. Cole is a great name. Sure. Yeah, I can. I'm sorry, I was just talking to Patrick there, Meyer. Uh, so to Cole, uh, what are some of the signs of a reputable fig professionals, or should I settle for a local grocery store meat and fish counter? Uh, well, thanks for the question, Cole. Appreciate it, and that's a great one. Uh, as I said a little bit earlier in my presentation, the number one thing that leads to great quality seafood dishes is starting with great quality food. It's 90% of the game right there. There's nothing I can do on this stove or anywhere else that can make up for poor quality fish. So having that good relationship is absolutely key. And that is in fact, the key word is relationship. Uh, I don't, you know what, your seafood professional, as you call them, a specialized butcher or, or market. Absolutely. If you've got great access to somebody like that, go for it, create that relationship and, uh, you know, <laughs> own it. I mean, I, this is great because I've got that up here in Maine, but not everybody has. And that's where, you know, the local sort of large grocery store comes in. And a lot of them are really doing a very good job these days. Uh, you can get absolutely great quality fish at Walmart in the frozen aisle. Uh, the Seabest brand is a really great one. does a good job with sustainability and, and delivering on quality. But, I mean, and hey, that's Walmart. And I don't use, I mean, I use them just because they're the common denominator in America to, to such an extent. Uh, but if you go to Wegmans, if you go to Hannaford's, if you go to Shaw's, Stop and Shop, any of Del Hayes, 
Albertsons, Whole Foods, of course, they're, they're doing a really good job with this. But the key is, again, that relationship and your senses. It's not just smelling the fish. What does the store smell like? What do the counter staff look like? Is their apron clean? Are they wearing a hairnet? Are, are they wearing a smile and looking at you in the eye, of, you know, kind of taking some pride in their area? Well, Cole, that is a really great start, right? If the person's looking at you in the eye and they're clean and the place smells good, you're, you are a lot of the way there. But generally, it's that idea of just creating that relationship, saying to whoever is behind the counter, introducing yourself, creating that sense of personal responsibility, but then let them do their jobs. This is the most important thing, which is to say, what's the best thing in the case? And then go home with that, because that's how you're going to get good quality seafood, not just making a demand of that system and hoping that what you bought was good quality. Hey, thanks, Cole. I appreciate you. I appreciate the questions. I'm going to read another one here from Hilda. What are various methods for cooking lane cod? The bones are enormous and gave me a very rich stock. So what's the best use for it? Hey, oh, uh, Hilda, I'm sorry. Uh, that's a great question. Good for you for having advantage to having uh, access to ling cod. I'm assuming you must be on the West Coast, uh, though we have some ling cod on this coast, on the East Coast well. But um, ling cod kind of eats, uh, well, like cod, it's got those big flakes to it. Excuse me, I'm to here. Uh, big flakes to it, but also has the meatiness, the richness to it. Almost has a sort of monkfish-like elasticity, a snap and bite to it, which is really, really pleasant. It's a great fish. Uh, I like doing braises with lingcod, salting it uh, up to about 12 hours before. And when I say salting, I mean just as much salt as you would regularly use to season a piece of fish. Uh, but then just letting it sit and letting the salt do its work. And what that will do is it will, again, sort of firm up that texture, but it, it really blooms the flavor of lingcod. Uh, start off with some fennel, garlic, and a lot of olive oil. Add a, a can of you know, uh, San Marzano peeled tomatoes. Let it simmer down. And as soon as the tomatoes begin to break apart, nestle your fish in. Turn the heat to very low. Put a top on it. Have a glass of wine. Cook some broccoli. Maybe some brown rice. Look your spouse in the eye, your partner, your friends. Enjoy the process. Oh, that smells good. Mm, Link on. Great. It's a very resilient fish. By salting it a little bit, you've given yourself even a little bit extra leeway. Uh, and tomato is another great pairing because of the acidity with white fish. Uh, just makes it sing. Hilda, thanks for your question. Appreciate you. Okay, uh, Eric, what type of white fish do you think will... Uh, will move in supply chain as a result of the slowdowns. Um, if I think I understand, uh, sorry, if I think I understand the question, uh, ah, which one would be more available? Um, well, you're going to start to see some of the frozen seafood is going to be a big part of the future. Uh, coming out of this, retailers are really investing a lot of their focus right now uh, on those species that are those products that are being frozen just for inventory control and reduced customer uh, interaction. And I totally get that. Uh, but that is also going to necessarily reduce initially some of the species that are available to sort of the big few, tilapia, swai, bassa, catfish, cod, pollock uh, in the interim period. But I do also think that it, ultimately it's going to open up our markets to more diversity. Because the reason why Pollock isn't available at your market is, well, it's it's all perishable and, it, and the retailer's taking a gamble on what you're gonna buy. And well, they're banking on cod because that's what we pretty much buy. But if they can sit on that inventory and it's not, they don't have to sell it immediately, you know, it makes sense that the number of species, the diversity in those frozen aisles could grow. And that is something I am, a hundred percent behind and in, in support of because um, that will get up, like, give us access to more localized regional fisheries uh, as well as to just greater culinary opportunities so uh, but certainly in the interim period you're going to see your staple products uh, really as being the the only ones in market in a lot of places thanks for your question okay another question from deb hi could you please speak or show us proper butchering, uh, deboning of a white fish of your choice? Thank you, and stay safe. Uh, I, you know what, Deb? I will. I would love to do that, and I will do that. I'm going to take some more questions before I dive back into the demo, also because Deb 
really my camera woman has walked away to uh, see to our beloved little three and a half year old boy. So I don't have a way to actually put the camera on the fish at the moment. So if I do again, I will let you know. Thanks. Megan, what's the, not the most fun question, but what is the best way to remove cod worms if you find them? Well, uh, that is a very good question. Hey, uh, so cod worms, here's a, a little bit of the ugly truth about ground fish, as this category of fish is often known, uh, is well, they're susceptible to uh, what are ultimately completely harmless parasites to us. And that in some instances, especially when buying from small scale producers uh, locally, uh, those worms are going to still be visible in the uh, fillet. There's a process used in large scale processing called candling, which is when a fillet is run over a, a backlit table and they're simply removed with tweezers. Now again, Megan, this is, as you say, not the most fun question or inspiring, hey, let's go eat seafood, but it is completely harmless. It is uh, something that you will also rarely encounter. So please do not worry about it or let that turn you off to seafood. But the easiest way to do it, simply make it uh, either cook the fish, at which point they just don't matter because it's, well, it's just part of the fish, if you ask me. Uh, but the other is just to gently press the flesh around them wherever you see them closest to the surface and pulling with a blunt pair of tweezers. Uh, they do come right out. Also salting uh, fish a little bit early kind of spoils the environment for them and they try to get out themselves. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, Linda. Chef, I'm curious about your opinion of food miles as it relates to seafood, i.e. Turbo Farm in Spain, as mentioned. Yep. And specifically as it relates to consumer choice, we want to support local small catch fisheries. Linda, thank you. That is a wonderful and awesome question, uh, and one answers of which and uh, the pursuit of which are close to my heart. Fisheries, to give a, a broad description, or a broad answer, is a global industry. It is the most globally traded food commodity. In fact, there is more seafood traded. There's two times more seafood traded globally than corn and soy combined. Uh, it is a massive industry that reaches, well, 70% plus of our planet, which is water in any community that lives on it. So inherently seafood right now comes from everywhere. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, we have the opportunity through our dollars to support sustainable fisheries around the globe, to demand sustainable practices that are then rewarded by our market dollars. So in this way, globalized fisheries can really be a great thing in terms of driving sustainability. Uh, but yes, there's also the very real issue of food miles and carbon, uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with the fish and its production. Uh, and yeah, we should, be, we should be focused on that. And that is another reason why I am very much pro-frozen. Uh, I just think frozen seafood, now that it, it is virtually comparable in quality to fresh, there's, in my mind, always reason to celebrate and have fresh seafood, but really the market should shift towards frozen, which is allowed to come from a boat, on, boat in Spain on a you know, slow boat and be transported by a train with low carbon cost to keeping it cold once it's frozen. That said, there's also very much reason to support and continue to grow, not just to support, but actually to encourage growth of local fish production, whether that's wild capture, uh, as we have access to here in New England, or whether that's aquaculture. Uh, and aquaculture is, you know, was an ugly word, but right now I see it as a beautiful word that is the future of our food system to a large extent. Uh, there's good wild fish, there's bad wild fish, there's good farm fish, there's bad farm fish. So supporting sustainably farmed seafood that's popping up in communities like Waterbury, Connecticut, where Ideal Fish is farming Bronzino. Hey, that's a really cool, there's shrimp being farmed up in Minnesota. That's really cool. Uh, and those types of markets are going to be created. Those types of market pathways are going to be created and you're going to have greater localized access. And I very much applaud that, but not to the exclusion of quality, responsible seafood sourced from uh, anywhere around the globe 
uh, from communities who are really benefiting from our engagement in that fishery. So there's a lot to that answer, if you couldn't tell. I used to teach an entire course in college on this. Um, so forgive me for a little bit of lengthy answer there, but uh, for more information on this, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, my email, uh, you can reach me through a, a link right there um, on the screen. Uh, but also check out Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program, the Marine Stewardship Council, as well as the Best Aquaculture Practices uh, and a couple other resources um, that I could share with you for more info. So again, a little bit of a long answer, but very complicated, but also very important. So thank you for your question. Okay, uh, what is your favorite fish to eat and why? All right, Don, uh, back to the fun questions. Um, and important ones too. My very favorite fish to eat is the bluefish, which is uh, for a lot of people, kind of the poster fish of, like, of trepanation, if you will. It's full flavored, it's robust, it is siren in its savor, it is, it's just wonderful fish. Uh, and when caught fresh uh, and served forth, it is, it's just the very best. Uh, it, it has so much beautiful sort of floral and beguiling aroma to it, so much presence on the plate in terms of just an interesting grayish color, which is really quite attractive and a beautiful moist flake and it just steams emitting this wonderful aroma and oozing fat onto the plate. I mean, it's such a good eating experience. It's so good. Uh, that said, Don, bluefish is my favorite fish when it is fresh out of the water. It is one of the very few fish that I just don't know, like frozen. So uh, I understand why some people don't like it because they might've had a bad experience with it. But fish like mackerel, fish like salmon even, which is quite robust in flavor. Bluefish, Opa, those are my favorite. Thanks. Okay, Maricela, how do I get the best flavor of the codfish and the perfect cook? So, to cook anything seafood-wise, except for steak fish, like tuna, but anything that's in a fillet form cooks pretty much well at low and slow. Put it in a, in a non-stick saute pan over medium-low heat with some butter and just let it sit. Cook 90% of the way up on one side, allowing that high heat contact to just uh, touch only a little bit of the flesh while that heat gently pushes up through. Turn the pan off and then flip it over just to let the residual heat of the pan cook it the rest of that 10% of the way through. So that way you've protected the flesh as it cooks mostly, you've added flavor through that slow, low caramelization. You've protected all the moisture and flavor in it. It's, it's just a great way to cook. Or you could just throw it in a toaster oven at 275 degrees. Um, those are the best ways to, to ensure that you're going to get the, a, a great outcome. But in terms of getting the best flavor is, again, getting back to the idea of salting it a little bit early. What that does is it draws out that moisture, so it kind of reduces the flavor a little bit, meaning intensifies it. Um, but what also what it does is it draws proteins out. Uh, water-soluble proteins out, and those oxidize uh, when exposed to the air after being drawn out, and so they mature in flavor, they evolve, and I just like the flavor better when it's a little aged. I, I think of it the same way as I can take this really nice bottle of wine that I've got that I've been cellaring for 20 years and open it up and take a drink real quick, or I could pour a little bit and swirl it around and give it a little bit of air and smell it. Like, that's the way to enjoy it. I almost think that the same way with, with whitefish. They need a little bit of that maturation of flavor. Hope that helps, Marisa. Okay, Shannon, should I let cooked cod or salmon rest for a few minutes before serving? Uh, certainly. Uh, the same principles apply to the idea of resting proteins with seafood as they do with meat, with a roast or a roast chicken, say. Uh, and the, the science behind that is when proteins coagulate or cook, these long strands kind of bind up and they, and they, and they contract. And what they do is that then they push out moisture that was between those cells. Uh, they push that moisture out. But as you rest a piece of cooked protein, those proteins begin to relax and sort of expand again and are able to reabsorb some of that moisture that had been forced out. So you end up literally just holding more of the moisture in the dish. So, Absolutely. Five minutes or so after it comes out of the, the oven, before you put your fork in it, that's great. But the other thing is also that seafood doesn't 
when cooked properly, to my opinion, you're not cooking it to the same temperatures as beef. And if you're cooking well done beef or chicken, 165, that's a lot of coagulation. That's a lot of tightness there. But seafood, you're only cooking it to about 130, 135 max, pretty much. So it is a gentler heat process. Um, so, so, again, a long answer, but there's a lot to it. Uh, but the answer is yeah, but pretty much the time between taking it out of the pan, putting it on a plate, getting it over to the table, actually getting people to sit down, figuring out if you have your wine, your fish is rested. Thanks for your question. Okay, uh, Brenda, do you wash fish before you cook it? Uh, no, I, I do not. Um, in the case of a whole fish, yes, I will, uh, to just get any lingering scales or something off. But the bottom line is that skin is still there to keep the good in, keep the bad out. Uh, in this case, the water, which would rob the flesh of flavor. But in terms of a filet, no, you don't ever want to touch it to water with the exception of seasoning it in a brine or something like that. But in that case, you're developing flavor, not drawing it out. Water just robs the fish of personality. Plus, uh, if you're trying to saute something, you want it to be as dry as possible. Or if you're trying to grill something, because when I put this filet in the pan, the first thing it needs to happen for it to cook as well as those proteins to coagulate. But if what's standing between the heat and those proteins is a layer of water, well, I have to cook off all that water first until you're creating steam and you're actually kind of working against the principles of what you're hoping to achieve with the saute or the nonstick on the grill. So the drier the flesh, the better it's going to be, and you keep all that flavor in. Thanks. <coughs> Excuse me there. Jennifer. Hi, Chef Barton. Oh, hi, Jennifer. Nice to be on with you. I find these fish presentations so informative. Well, thank you. Do you grill white fish at all, or do you avoid doing so because of flakes and can fall through the grates? Uh, that is a great question, uh, and one that kind of goes back to, well, many of the things we've spoken of, including that green salting. I'll get to that in a second. White fish doesn't necessarily take smoke well. Other fish do. Fish that are, are rich, uh, salmon, bluefish, mackerel, herring, all of those, oh, man, they take to see smoke so very well. But with some preparations with white fish, the smoke can end up making it taste a little tinny, uh, a little metallic, not in a super unpleasant way, but just not in a, eh, it's not the best outfit for it tonight, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but some species like cod and haddock particularly, uh, oh my God, they're so good smoked. And just that hint, that rustic, seductive, sexy smoke that comes off the grill and a little bit of char from the juices dripping down. Jennifer, can you tell I'm ready to be outside in Maine? It's still 40 degrees and I want to be grilling. Um, so in those cases, yes, I would say haddock, cod are good for grilling, but you have to be very careful. I would suggest pre-salting them, again, to sort of constrict it and to give it a little more structural integrity. And then the other thing I would recommend is uh, um, indirect grilling. So indirect grilling is when, if you'll allow me here, the, the grill grate, and you have your fire on one side, so over here, and you have all your coals or your, just your burners turned on over here and not over here. Set the fish down on the grate directly over the hottest side, directly over that fire. Immediately cover the grill to capture that heat to create a very full, flavorful, ambient uh, cooking environment. And then after just a couple of minutes, which is enough to just get a couple of grill marks on there, you know, just to get a little bit of that flavor. Please do not make the error of thinking that you need crosshatch grill marks. That's only for show. You've already gotten all the flavor you want out of this piece, out of that technique of the grilling when you put it down and give it just a few minutes. You don't need to pick it up and move it because all that does is increase, in, dramatically increase your risk of breaking it and feeding the fire and not your family. I don't even touch the fish at this point. I put it down and here's what I do. Once I got my couple minutes, I take the top off, I pick up the whole grill grate, turn it around and put it back down and cover the grill again. So now we've got this gentle undulation of heat that's cooking flavorfully, slowly, um, you know, and that's where air control comes into play, manage the fire. Or if you're using a gas grill, 
you set it down on a burner that's set to high with a burner that's set to low next to it. And then once you get enough char over here, you turn this one to low and you turn this one to high and you cover the grill. And the same thing, you're creating this oven convection like effect. So that's how to cook whitefish on the grill and a couple of species that take well. Thanks. All right, Will, I'd love to hear something about court bouillon poaching. Thank you. All right, Will. So court bouillon poaching, court bouillon is a French term for the, it basically means poaching broth uh, and doesn't specify to my knowledge, at least a specific recipe so much as a construction. So it's mostly water uh, and then oftentimes an acidity. So white wine, red wine, vinegars, uh, lemon juice, depending on whatever flavors you're going to impart, because anything you put in this liquid becomes the, becomes the conduit of those flavors into the fish. Uh, and so that's why the court bouillon has its own sort of recipe or construction idea. Uh, and that's exactly what I had done with the cod over here. I had made a court bouillon of water, red wine, a good amount of red wine vinegar, uh, some orange peel, uh, and some leek greens, um, and some allspice, just a, you know, a fun sort of dark and broody selection of flavors, all sort of uh, punctuated with the, the floral aroma of the orange. You can play around with it anything you want to, and, and that can cross cuisines, whether you're looking to do something, I don't know, Sicilian-inspired or Spanish-inspired or uh, Southeast Asian, even though some of the, that method might not be inherent to that cuisine, the incorporation of ingredients indicative too uh, is, you know, a world of opportunity. So that's why I really like poaching. Um, low impact, low risk, uh, because you're cooking it so low and slow. Thanks. All right, Sebastian, we're I know we're coming up on time here. We're just past uh, three o'clock. Uh, so I would like to say to all of you, you do have to jump off. Thank you so very much for joining us here today. Uh, I'll take a number more questions and stick around with you. Uh, Again, please uh, check out some of my books uh, available at your now online local book retailer, uh, as well as large book retailers. Check out our seafood literacy course. Uh, keep feeding your neighbors and friends and your family. Feeding people is an act of love and generosity, and we all need a lot of that right now. So thanks to all of you who are cooks. Thanks for joining me today. I appreciate you if you have to sign off and stay with me if you have more time. So I'll take the next question. All right, uh, from Sebastian, give us your true opinion on BASA. Great work, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, so BASA, B-A-S-A, is a uh, chiclid, or it's a catfish species. Uh, it is not allowed any longer to be called catfish in this country due to trade rules, uh, but catfish, swai, BASA, tra, uh, are all very similar fish in the way that they are shaped, in the way that their tissue is, is pretty elastic, but still yielding and giving a soft flake. Uh, it's got a complex flake that helps it, instead of cod, which is kind of convex like a spoon, uh, catfish can be kind of Z-shaped, and so it sticks together a little bit better, giving a, a just slightly different textural con contrast, which I like very much. Uh, but to the specific question, what's my true opinion on BASA, uh, it's, it comes down to, like everything else, it, it's how it's produced. Uh, there's really great quality BASA out there, uh, and there's very poor, poor quality BASA out there um, that has a very bad environmental reputation. But it's not fair, nor accurate, nor I think helpful to judge an entire industry by the ill actions of some members of it, especially when we have you know, exemplary members in aquaculture who are really pushing boundaries and, and evolving sustainability technologies at warp speed. It's really pretty cool. So that said, uh, I'm actually not very familiar with BASA. Uh, I think it's a great culinary ingredient. It's not my favorite. Um, I just prefer other species. I prefer other flavors and, and textures. Um, but I think it's a perfectly good ingredient when grown well. And that extends to you know, catfish as well. Catfish, I think, can be a truly marquee ingredient when grown really well. Um, but then tilapia, other species like that, it really depends on the producer. So again, getting back to the question earlier about how to buy fish well, introduce yourself to the people behind the counter if you can. Uh, find a source that you trust and hey, just 
post them the question. Thanks. Shannon, you mentioned earlier that we aren't in olive oil season yet. It's still butter season. Please elaborate because I would love to know uh, best oils and fats to cook seafood. Uh, you know, Shannon, I thought I was going to get called out on that when I said that, heard myself say it. So uh, thank you for that. It's actually a fun talking point. Um, I, I just anecdotally delineate between butter and olive oil season just by the weather. Do I feel like something, you know, do I feel like a rich puree soup, you know, with a little bit of cream garnish to it, or do I feel like gazpacho is a better you know, sort of analogy of comfort foods to, uh, to warm weather foods. But um, with whitefish, whitefish as a category are universally great friends with butter. Um, butter is great with just about every seafood in terms of the lactic acid, uh, to the richness of the fish, to the aroma of butter, that milky dairiness, to the actual fat and richness of it. It's just a, a good companion. Olive oil, uh, of course, is an incredible companion to many, many fish. However, I think that both with butter and with olive oil, there are some fish that are just, they are just perfect when paired with butter or just perfect when paired with olive oil. Um, and those are few and far between. Uh, but like flounder, I, I think flounder is really a butter fish more so than an olive oil fish. I think it's just flattered better. Uh, but in terms of the best oils to cook with, I mean, that's my argument for butter versus olive oil. But other, other oils or fats to cook with, uh, I have some pistachio or almond oil or something like that around most of the time. I'm very fortunate for that. Uh, I use a little bit of that drizzled on as a finishing. So I might use just a couple of drops of vegetable oil to saute something or just to put underneath it before roasting it and then use this garnish oil over the top. Any nut oil is going to be great uh, you know, in adding flavor and richness and, and also giving it almost a, a regional sort of cuisine specific appeal. Uh, I'm looking around at the other oils that I have. Uh, that's about what I use. Uh, and I use olive oil for just about everything. Uh, in terms of sautéing, most of the sautéing that I do, as I did with that dish earlier with the hake, everything in the pan ends up being part of what's on the plate. So in that way, I just use olive oil. Um, I also don't use enough high heat to break down the olive oil, which is why they say don't sauté with it. But I don't use heat that high very often. So... Uh, again, sort of a little bit of a wandering answer there, but uh, you're talking about one of the four true elements of cuisine, which is fat. So there's a lot to discuss, but thanks for your question. All right, I'll take just a, a couple more here because I feel my, my toddler running around upstairs and I'm going to go do some dad duty. But um, from Ingela, uh, could you give some estimates for how long to cook a cod? What thickness of cod require what kind? I'm usually cooking in the oven. Thank you. Well, uh, so I would uh, urge you to turn down your oven. So 300 degrees is perfect for cod. And at 300 degrees, I would say about 12 minutes per inch of thickness. Uh, anything less than that, I would go down. I would start checking it after eight minutes. But the way to tell a fish is done is that if you can flake it with just a little bit of pressure from a finger and it flakes apart, it is done. No matter how what it looks like, it is done. Raw fish doesn't flake uh, under pressure. It can rip, but it won't flake. So that's an easy way to tell it's done. And even if you're just in the toaster oven and you got a fork and you just, oh, it's done. Great. But again, I'm getting a little conversational and anecdotal, but that's how I do it in my house. And, but uh, 8 to 12 minutes. There you go. Thanks. All right, uh, Amy. What about great lake species? Amy, that's a great question. Uh, our oceans, lakes, and rivers all provide us with seafood and the Great Lakes, uh, a lot of great quality stuff. I got to say that I am not uh, terribly familiar with a lot of the species up there. I certainly know uh, perch and walleye and bluegill and, and crappie and, and other ones and pike. And, uh, you know, there's such a range of delicious flavors. A lot of them are pan fish, so cook kind of more like snapper wood in terms of the way we think of the filet in, in the pan. A lot of them are very thin, uh, but I do find that great that lake fish or freshwater fish universally uh, is very much best served with butter rather than olive oil. Olive oil can end up bringing out a somewhat of a grassiness 
uh, in the fish, just, and that's totally normal. It's just an affectation of, of the water uh, in which they grow and, and how their physiology works, which I could completely dork out on, but I won't. Um, so I would recommend any Great Lakes fish that's safe to eat via local uh, guidelines because freshwater fish can uh, absorb some toxicity, especially in the recreational fish. So um, I don't mean to scare you away from them by any means, but just it's worth checking. Uh, and uh, yeah, cooking with butter. Cooking with the skin on too, because they tend to be a little bit leaner. And so the skin will help retain the moisture as well as protect the flesh uh, and the structural integrity. And then if, if you choose to, just peel it right off when you're done. Thanks. Okay, this will be my last question. Um, uh, and I'll go back to England. I'll take two more here. I like that one. Uh, do I understand you right that if a recipe calls for cod, I can exchange it with a flatfish? They're quite different in texture and taste. Thank you. Uh, they can be quite different in texture and taste, but they're also similar enough that they are capable. You, you are capable of uh, just replacing them. So let's uh, let's just do a little demo here. So here's the cod in your recipe. That's a piece of cod. It's about an inch thick. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what your recipe calls for. But I do have this yellowtail flounder over here, um, which I will quickly fillet up to just show what the strategy is on the fish. So, and I know you can't necessarily see this, so my apologies at that time. Okay, so here's your flounder fillet, and I leave the little skin, uh, the little fin fat on there. It's it's delicious. Why not? And might as well eat it, right? Instead of throw it away. So yes, these are going to cook very differently. They're going to look differently. They're even going to have to be handled differently in the pan, just literally by different utensils. And yes, there's a lot different there. But that's where you kind of begin to just reduce the variables as best you can. So you just Roll that up, and now you've got similar thickness. Now, I, I know that I'm not giving you anything revolutionary, and I don't mean to, to be so simple in the answer, but I guess what I'm getting at is these two fish are different. You're absolutely right, but they are similar enough that if you look at what are the true variables and the physicality of the cooking and try to reduce them to your best ability, then they end up being similar enough that you're going to end up with successful and delicious results in whatever your recipe is. Thanks. All right, last question here from Kelly. I was told to soak fish in milk to remove any quote unquote fishy taste. Is this wrong? Uh, that is a very old New England thing. It's a, a, a tradition that is still alive in many ways. Uh, I know carp uh, is common and catfish are commonly soaked in milk uh, to reduce, to re did dry out that what it is is that lactic acid can dry out any muddy flavors, typically in freshwater fish. Uh, and so that's what I understand why it was used uh, in freshwater. Uh, in saltwater fisheries, like the fishy, as you called it, fish, which I like to call in, intense, robust, full flavored. Fishy to me is a bad word that describes the guy on those neighborhood watch signs, you know, wearing the, the trench coat, being fishy, right? Seafood is delicious. It's just fully, fully flavored, intense, robust. Um, so those fishy fish uh, in in classic New England cuisine, there was uh, some techniques in, by which they were soaked in milk again to draw out some of that flavor. Uh, but I think what that was based on more is that uh, back when those recipes were very common and appearing in culinary texts, uh, refrigeration was not always as widespread and travel and uh, market pathways supply chain were not as sophisticated. So I think the fish was generally a little bit older and the milk was a way to mask it rather than to rectify it. So bottom line is these days, if you need to soak your fish in milk to make up for its quality, I would suggest buying better quality fish. So... And that was with all due respect to traditional uh, recipes that call for that as, as part of the, the culture of that dish. Um, so anyway, so thank you all so very much. I know we still have a lot of questions. 
and I'm sorry to leave you here, but please join us every Thursday uh, at this time. We're doing webinars on different species. And as always, ask me anything. We also do some just office hours with Ruby in general. You can ask me about artichokes or unicorn steaks or tilapia, whatever you want. So please uh, keep a lookout in your email and social media for that. Follow me on social media at Barton Seaver. Uh, again, please check out some of our uh, our books online as well as uh, our seafood course. But ultimately, keep feeding each other, keep loving each other, keep washing your hands, and stay safe. Take care. 